Hello, and welcome to the South Coast Artist Index, where artists, performers, and writers, as well as curators, directors, and supporters, anyone with ties to the creative community, drops by to introduce themselves to you. We'll talk about their beginnings, their vision, their passion, and so much more. Hi, uh, this is Ron Fortier, your host of the In Focus podcast, brought to you by theartistindex.com. And today uh, we have a very unique guest, um, and I will let them introduce themselves to you and spell their name as has become de rigueur on this show, because you never know what the last name, if there's a story there. Sometimes it's a hit and sometimes it's a miss. So with that in mind, could you please introduce yourself and spell your last name? Okay, thank you, Ron. My name is Ralph Hickok, that's H-I-C-K-O-K, and I once had a bank teller think I was trying to pass myself off as Alfred Hitchcock. <laughs> so there is a story there. Thank you for the hit, <laughs> because I sweat these out all the time. Uh, but you never know. Some of the stories are like uh, 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 James Bobrick. Okay, Jim Bobrick. Oh, yeah. He said, everybody thinks I'm from down south because my last name is Bob Rick. You know, like Bobby Joe, you know, <laughs> Billy Lee. Yeah, Jim, yeah Jim, Jim is a neighbor of ours. He lives a couple houses up the <laughs> yeah, street from yeah, us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's crazy. Um, now, you've had a long and storied career. Well, long anyway, yeah. Oh, come on. There's a lot of stories in there. Well, in that. yeah, there are quite a few stories. <laughs> and uh, with that, let's let's start from uh, from day one. <laughs> we got time? <laughs> well, as, as I mentioned, this happens to be the 56th anniversary of the day I started working at the Standard Times, November 25th, 1963. And uh, I had been in Ohio working for a small newspaper in Ohio, and I left there the day JFK was assassinated. And... Uh, and uh, ironically, I, I had left Massachusetts for Ohio the day he was inaugurated. So um, You feel I, somehow linked <clears throat> in some well, way? Well, not really, but I, I haven't moved very far since then. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah. Um, and going back, were they still producing the Evening Standard back then? or was it? Well, it was an evening paper, yeah, at that time. Uh, there had been, before I got here, there was a paper called The Morning Mercury, but that, that shut down, I think, in 1941, 1942. Mm -hmm. And I originally started at the Standard Times just on the copy desk to kind of learn the ropes, and then I became... Uh, uh, they had decided to revamp their Sunday magazine, and, and uh, they made me editor of the Sunday magazine, which was called the Southeasterner at the time. And the one that was all printed in sepia color? Uh, well, yeah, it was a roto the group. That's easy for me to say, a yeah. roto gravure <laughs> section. Okay. Yeah. And I, I'm only drinking water, I swear. <laughs> Maybe, hey, I think we need to strengthen that. <laughs> roto gravure, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's generally me in your seat doing that. So anyway. And, uh, <laughs> And I think it was the best job in the newspaper business. I, uh, you know, I, it was like putting out a weekly newspaper, really. And uh, I got to interview a lot of interesting people, artists, musicians, performers, authors. And I pretty much did what I wanted to. I, who, who were some of the notables, Ralph, if you don't uh, mind me asking, uh, uh, that you interviewed uh, for the Southeastern Magazine? Uh, well, uh, they weren't all for the Southeastern because I also I was also assistant Sunday editor, but mm -hmm. I, I interviewed uh, people like uh, Johnny Carson, uh, Joan Fontaine, Myrna Loy. Uh, 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 oh, so there are so many of them, you know, I can't... Uh, uh, in 63 was uh, or, or at least in, in the mid 60s was the Zyterian still a performing arts or a uh, theater I think at that time it was shut down but uh, but at some point uh, somebody revived it as a, a movie theater as a, the, the I, state. Think, I think it was still called the state at yeah. that time yeah and uh, uh, but it was in pretty bad physical shape I yeah. know I, I went down there a couple of times just out of curiosity, you know, to see what was going on, and and there were leaks, you know, it was yeah, just yeah, plaid a, seats. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> it was kind of a sad place actually. Yeah. yeah. Um, most memorable time um, that uh, you know, because you are in walking history right now, believe it or not. Well, you you know, I I I told somebody the other day that mm -hmm. I'm. 
I realize that I'm an old timer in New Bedford now because when I walk down Union Street, I I don't say what was there before that. I say what was there before what was there before that. You know, so you know where everything was, but you have no idea where anything is. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But, uh, what, why New Bedford? From Green Bay, Wisconsin to New Bedford. That seems like some sort of a weird traje- uh, trajectory. Well, I, I went, uh, actually, I went to Harvard uh, after graduating from high school in Wisconsin, and then I went to Ohio, worked for a small newspaper there. But I wanted to get back to the East Coast. And uh, actually, I, I was on the Cape on vacation, and I went to the Cape Cod Standard Times uh, for a job interview. And uh, the the person I talked to there suggested I should also try the New Bedford Standard Time. So I got a job. I was you know an itinerant newspaper man. There mm-hmm. were a lot of those around in mm-hmm. those days. Now, are you published as well? Uh, yeah, I've, uh, I'm a sports historian. I've written several books about sports. My uh, most recent one was uh, uh, called Vagabond Halfback: The Saga of Johnny Blood McNally, which is the biography of a very interesting guy who played for the Packers back in the olden days and was quite a character. He, uh, when I, I, I wrote him a letter. To, he was in uh, living in St. Paul, Minnesota at the time. I wrote him a letter about, uh, told him I wanted to write a book about him and uh, told him a little bit about my background because I'd already published a book. So I, I mailed the, the letter from New Bedford on a Tuesday. I remember this very distinctly. It was Tuesday, February 1972. And on Sunday afternoon, I got a phone call. And uh, he said, Ralph, uh, this, this is uh, John McNally. You know me as Johnny Blood. And so, of course, I was delighted that he, he called, called mm-hmm. so soon. And then he said, I'm, I'm parked in front of the newspaper office, but it's all locked up because it's Sunday. How do I get to your house from here? <laughs> and, uh, so, so then when I, I, I asked him uh, sometime later, we, we got to know one another, and I said, John, why, why did you, you know, I know other people that wanted to write your biography. Why did you pick me? And he said, well, there are two reasons. Uh, first... You're from Green Bay, so I didn't have to tell you about Green Bay and the Packer history and so forth. And second, uh, I'm a big Moby Dick fan, and I wanted to visit the Whaling Museum, and you gave me an excuse to do that. Wow, <laughs> serendipity with purpose. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, that's that's interesting. Um, how many other uh, books have you published, and other other sports? Figures have you been you know zeroed? In well, uh, at my my book most of my books have been reference works. Mm-hmm. There's a, a my first one was Who Was Who in American Sports, which is kind of uh, fifteen hundred obituaries or thereabouts, and then I did the New Encyclopedia of Sports uh, for McGraw Hill, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, a big fat <laughs> book called the Encyclopedia of North American Sports History for Facts on File, and uh, uh, a Who's Who in Sports Champions, which was Houghton Mifflin, and the Pro Football Fans Companion. Wow. And then most recently, I, uh, uh, I can't really call myself an, uh, an author, I guess really a compiler. I mm-hmm. put together a bibliography of of I think just about every book ever written about American football. Wow! Um, and you did that the old-fashioned way before the internet. Uh, oh no, no, this is okay. very recent. Oh, this, this that was, one's very recent. Yeah, this okay. was uh, this was published uh, earlier this year. In fact. Okay. All right. So you're still you're still at it. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's excellent. That's excellent. Have you ever heard of? And this is just for my curiosity. Okay. Gunnar McGonagall. No, that's a great name, but no. <laughs> uh, supposedly the uh, Fall River Mason who uh, invented the catcher's mitt unawares. Oh, no, no. I don't. Because he used a Mason's mitt. Because they used to throw oh, bricks up. They, used to, they actually looked like, and I'm the least sports guy, mind you, guy you ever want to meet. But I guess they look like a, what the old first baseman's glove. Oh, yeah, like. yeah, yeah, yeah. And because of the smacking of the hardball, 
he supposedly d- developed that. No, and I, I was, never, it was one of those book of facts that, that I wow. read that I, in, and I, I was just sort of cu- curious about yeah, that. Yeah, I, I got to write that down. I might have to add it to a future edition. <laughs> now, <laughs> beside the newspaper, you were also uh, uh, a part of the of SEA, correct? The yeah, S- that's Southeast right. Southeast Advertising. I, I left the Standard Times uh, April of 1973 and became chief copywriter at uh, at uh, Southeastern Advertising Agency. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How long uh, uh, was was that for now? It was just short of a quarter century, actually. Wow. I was there for like 20, 24 and a half years, I think. So you were there through the whole transition uh, of, uh, of Milton... Uh, um, oh, my God. He was like my uncle, and I'm blanking out on his last name. Oh, George. George, George my George. God. Uh, it's, like, yeah, it's horrible. Because yeah. I remember uh, the two people in town... Uh, I never wanted to really, I was always interested in advertising, but really wanted to be a painter and a painting instructor. Yeah. But when I found that I couldn't do it, I backtracked a little bit, and I always thought, I always wanted to have an office like, like Milt uh, George or a, an office like Billy Cabral, who was in the middle of what is now the Webster Bank building. It was the first national bank. Oh, yeah. He was the promotions guy. Yeah. And it just seemed like it was such a fun kind of a job to have, you yeah, know, with all these yeah. trinkets in the office and stuff like that. Uh, but you were there when he transitioned over um, to um, the, the travel and tourism industry. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. When, when I started, uh, uh, SEA was in the Vera building, and uh, that was a whole bunch of little offices. Yeah, on the that was one of my floor. dad's accounts as well. Yeah. That's I think that's how he met Milt. Yeah. yeah, okay. And I think Milt started there with just his office, and then an office for Ruth Jaquel, who I remember Ruthie, yeah, uh, uh, who be, started as the secretary and became a vice president, and then mm-hmm. an office for John Kurgan, who became mm-hmm. art director, and eventually. I think I think we had like seven or eight little offices in uh, there. Steve, um, Steve Cook. Steve Cook. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, and uh, so so it was Steve kind Cook of, was the layout the layout guy, wasn't? Oh it? Yeah, 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 okay, yeah. So it was kind of weird because you'd I mean to get to if I wanted to see Milt, I you know I'd I'd get walk out of my office and walk down the hallway and walk into his office. It was like going to see a lawyer or an accountant or something. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, soon afterward, in September of 73, uh, we, SEA, bought the building at the corner of uh, 6th Street. And oh, the old Dartmouth Club. And moved in there. Yes, right, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, And uh, so we moved in. When we first moved in there, there was a dance studio on the third floor. And uh, shortly after schools let out, we could hear the... The young dancers on on our ceiling. <laughs> it was kind of funny, but they, uh, we soon took over the third floor. Yeah, I don't think we needed the space. We just wanted to get rid, of, rid the of the sound of the tapping the feet on the <laughs> ceiling. Exactly, exactly. So. Um, uh, let's let's go into that that phase of your life with the advertising. What were some of the biggest accounts that you uh, you had handled? The biggest campaigns? Well, we did. Uh, Quite a range. We did a lot of travel tourism. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was through what was then known as the Bristol County Development Council, uh, and we also did some high tech stuff. For Isotronics, for example, was one of our big clients, and that's a, you know, very specialized, technical kind mm-hmm. of thing. So it was really quite a range that we did. Uh, I- Isotronics uh, makes. Uh, Packages for hybrid micro micro circuits, which is you know, pretty esoteric kind of stuff. Yeah, you know? yeah. And uh, but we did uh, through the Bristol County Development Council, we did the Whaling Museum and uh, uh, Battleship Cove. Those right. were the, the two Americana places. Trail was uh, was a, yeah we of created your the American right? Trail. Yeah, right. right. Yeah, we did that, and uh, <clears throat> uh, we were asked to do a project for the the nation's bicentennial and that was it but we actually did it in 1975 to kind of get Mm -hmm. it going yeah that was uh, uh, now now you also did um, the New Bedford Fisherman brings out the best in seafood yeah right we worked with Clem Daly Clem Daly Mm -hmm. now there's a story Uh, my dad well you you know my daddy was he, he ran Rollins Clean Sweep janitorial service so um, I go downtown, and for me, it's like you know, oh, yeah. I've been in that office. Well, oh yeah, I've cleaned that yeah, office. Yeah. I cleaned that office because right. you know yeah. my brother Jim and I uh, 
uh, you know, we were the free help. Yeah, <laughs> and, right. uh, and that's how I got to know uh, uh, Milt George. And um, Clem Daly was also one of my dad's accounts. And I remember being at the University of uh, Miami and this woman named uh, Marilyn, uh, another painter, um, comes uh, bursting into my, my studio screaming, Ron, Ron, New Bedford's on fire. I said, what are you talking Uh-oh. about? Because, you know, we weren't that tuned in with media. Yeah, uh, right. And she had a television in her studio, which was kind of, of, of odd. And she says, Walter Cronkite said that New Bedford is burning. Uh-oh. And I said, what? So I went down to her studio and I saw, you know, Walter Cronkite reporting on the devastation. So I called up my mother using a payphone because, you know, no cell phones. You know, who could afford a landline down in Miami? Um, as a student, and she said, what are you all excited about? I said, Mom, Walter Cronkite is, you know, she lives in Dartmouth. Walter Cronkite said the city's burning. She said, well, Donna, if I know, I don't smell any smoke. <laughs> so I, I, I caught up with my father, and he said, oh, yeah, he says, that was horrible. He says, I just left Clem Daly's office, he said, and all of a sudden I felt something, oh, wow. and I was lifted. He, he said his feet were on the curb, his, his backside was to the entrance of Clem's building. Yeah. He felt his feet leave the curb oh, and wow. felt something push him across the street when all hell just broke oh, loose. Wow. And Clem yeah, was yeah. lucky yeah. Uh, to be to, to now, have now, where, he was in the building. Where was Clem's office? I was trying to it was remember on, this the other day, uh, where his office was. You know where the, the uh, Tia Maria's? In, it was in that oh, neighborhood okay. right there. Okay. Um, uh, I believe, yeah, I believe yeah, it was in okay, that Okay, that sounds about right. I, I, I was just thinking about Clem and trying to remember where his office yeah, was. Yeah, and uh, another other old timer in advertising, and uh, uh, I'm, I was thinking of um, of um, I don't know why I'm thinking of McSorley's. That's in Greenwich Village. Um, yeah, I met Jackie Gleason there. Once. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> That's another story. That's another story. <laughs> but uh, where is the uh, the uh, Cuffy uh, Paul Cuffy uh, Memorial? There was an Irish oh, uh, yeah. uh, uh, tavern there, McSweeney's. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember the name. Yeah, of it. all of a sudden it, it just flies out of your head. But I worked at Gulf Hill uh, Parlor, and on Sundays we would pick up our our produce. They would drop it off there, yeah. and then I'd have to go in there and pick it up. And that was kind of an interesting thing. You know, you're 14, 15 years old going into this bar with all these grizzly yeah. guys there. O'Malley's. O'Malley's Tavern. Yeah. O'Malley's, yeah. 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 O'Malley's, exactly, yeah. So that was like the first place that I thought of, and that place was totally oh, wiped yeah. off the yeah, map. Yeah, that's gone, yeah. And it was, it was kind of crazy. Um, and, you know, I, I was working on my master's thesis uh, which uh, was uh, tentatively called Fire and Ice. It was about the 1861 Arctic whaling uh, expedition disaster oh, yeah. where these, these yeah. vessels were locked in, in ice and then some of them caught fire. And, and it, just, it was just all kind of a weird vortex of things that were, that were coming together. Wow. Um, so um, high points and low points, so to speak. Uh, well, I think the Americana Trail was certainly a high point. That was uh, uh, we we won. Or the, I say we. The, the Bristol uh-huh. County Development uh, Council won a lot of national recognition for that because it was a it was a regional thing, which was very unusual at that time. Um, instead of focusing just on their own turf. Uh, the Americana Trail actually covered from Mystic, you know, which mm-hmm. is two states away, yeah. to Plymouth. To the SOBs that grabbed the uh, Charles W. Morgan. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, so that was, uh, I, I don't want to say revolutionary, but it was certainly something that was very rarely done at that time. Right. You know? And uh, so they won, you know, some national awards for, for the region of their regional approach. To right. That. You, that was a big, big thing. You were well ahead of the that. curve on all that stuff. Yeah, I think I think we were. And, and then also uh, fulfillment, uh, uh, um, informational request fulfillment, uh, Yankee Magazine. Oh, yeah, Yankee Magazine. The, the bingo and cars. The Southern was, Living was yeah, another Southern one. Living, yeah, exactly. That, I wasn't really part of that. That mm-hmm. was, you know, that was kind of, as far as I was yeah, concerned. Yeah, Ruthie ran that, didn't she? Yeah, exactly, yeah. 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 Now, oh. Somebody has a burning question. They asked me this months back when I was writing an article about, uh, I was trying to find um, uh, images, photographs of my stepfather's uh, fishing boats uh, going back into the, oh, I guess, late 40s, all the way until uh, some huge North Atlantic storm in 
68, uh, broke his back in three places, and that was the end of his career. Um, he survived. He was a tough little guy. He died four days short of his 100th birthday uh, oh, wow. last May. But the fishermen on you know the blue and gold, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. who was the model for that? I, I have no idea. Clem Daly did that illustration. He did do it. Yeah. Yeah. See, Clem... Uh, uh, Clem kind of drew on the the resources of SEA a mm. lot, and uh, uh, because he just didn't, you know, he was mm -hmm. a, a one man shop yeah. really. So uh, I'm sure that we did a, a lot of other versions of that sketch for various materials, mm -hmm. but but Clem did that original drawing, and the the slogan actually I came up with in you know when we. We were kind of helping Clem with some right. of the stuff. I, I did a lot of copywriting for Clem because right. he didn't. Uh, I mean, he could write copy, but sometimes right. he'd want you know something a little fancy or something. I, right. I would do it. For now, him. you guys were also ahead of the curve there too, uh, trying to get the fishermen united, which uh, could be akin to you know herding cats uh, back <laughs> yeah, in those days. Yeah, yeah it was. Uh, we actually. Uh, we tried to talk them into a, a real branding program, which they just wouldn't go for because mm -hmm. it would have been too expensive. But it was the, the the Seafood Producers Association actually had a lot of money in a promotional uh, fund of some kind. Mm -hmm. I, I don't. I guess they'd been putting money away for years for mm -hmm. promotion and never did anything with it. Yeah. And finally, they decided that they wanted to spend some, and they they went to Clem. Yeah. And then Clem came to us to you know give them some ancillary help with right. it. Right. It was Stanley uh, Mickelson too. I think it was part of this. Yeah, Stanley yeah. Mickelson, and um, uh, the, there was a guy named Jimmy. What was his last name? Jimmy. Um, I can't think of his name. Yeah. Uh, but he he was. I think he really kind of spearheaded it. And he had been, a, he was an interesting guy. He had been a fisherman and, you know, kind of worked his way up the ranks mm -hmm. until he became, I think he was in charge of marketing for the Seafood Producers Association. I'm not, his name will come to me yeah. eventually, but, uh, um, but, but yeah, they, for a while there, they became very active. Not in, Flood. Uh, uh, no. Okay. No. no yeah, I, I see my, my, my point in time, uh, I, when I had my little agency, uh, I represented the New Bedford Seafood Co-op. Okay. Uh, and uh, with Jerry Wheeler, made some strides uh, that couldn't be done when you guys would, you know, were the New Bedford Seafood producers because the mindset was slightly different. Because I think when you guys were working on that, you had the Dragoman versus the Scallopers. It was... Oh, yeah. There was, yeah, that stuff going on. A yeah. lot of that cultural kind of thing. And yeah. Then, uh, uh, overly focused on on today and sh and uh, totally short-sighted on, 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 on the future. Uh, they just went trip by trip, uh, yeah, haul back exactly. by haul back. Yeah. You know, I, I think people forget that the, the scallop industry was really going downhill for a long time because of the overfishing. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the the fishermen just really refused to acknowledge that that was happening. And finally, you know, they they uh, well under pressure, they finally mm -hmm. uh, came to realize it and to do something about it. And you know, now scalloping is back in a pretty big way. But there there was a time in the the seventies and early eighties when it was it was really in trouble. Yeah, uh, they they just uh, seemed to. Uh, have all run and hide, and then all of a sudden it was a bloom or whatever. There was a, I think it's a classic tale now. I think it's a, a scalloper out of Menemsha. Uh The guy became very greedy or whatever the term you want to use. He added on more shucking houses, and he, the last trip, he was so overloaded, he flipped over, and I think a majority of the crew was killed. Oh, uh, yeah, and yeah. it was basically because of the glut, uh, you know, oh, of, yeah, uh, yeah. of trying to do that. Um, uh, when you arrived in town, was the seafood, uh, the scallop festival, a thing yet? Or oh yeah, okay, yeah, it was. Uh, in fact, uh, at the Standard Times, we put out a, a scallop festival edition every year, and that was my baby from mm -hmm. 
Well, I think from 1965, and I think the Scala Festival ended maybe 67 or 68, but we, we put out a tabloid in mm-hmm. which uh, uh, about the Scala Festival. And, yeah, that was quite a big thing. But I believe at that time uh, the scallops were actually donated to to whoever ran the festival because um, the, the price of scallops was so low. I heard they were 27 cents a pound and primarily bought for cat food. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that, that could you imagine well that? Be, yeah. The other thing that, that jumps in my mind too from that same time period was the the Lions Pancake Breakfast. Those were the two oh, yeah. big events. Yeah, I'd forgotten uh, yeah. about those t- type of things, yeah. you know. And that's what the whole purpose of not just these podcasts, is, but the, the 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 whole overarching you know the umbrella of the artist uh, index is to get these memories down and and make these connections because. Um, these are these are uh, things that uh, when we go, they go with us, and uh, things remain alive or remain um, um, uh, important uh, as long as there's someone there to to, to recall them. Yeah, you know? right. Yeah, yeah. And uh, a lot of employers, for example, get rid of older workers not understanding the value of institutional memory. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, and that institutional memory is, is, is super, super important. Um, now, what was probably one of your, your, your most favorite projects or, or, or books or whatever that, that, that you've worked on uh, in all these years? Well, the experience with Johnny Blood was Johnny Blood McNally was certainly seemed the character. Yeah, and he we spent a period of uh, I think about five years. He would come to New Bedford and uh, he'd stay at the Skipper typically, and we you know I'd interview him after hours and we'd chat and uh, and we went on a couple of road trips which were pretty funny. Uh, at, at, we we went to the, the we went to the tenth anniversary of the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio. He, he's a charter member of the mm-hmm. Pro Football Hall of Fame, so we went there so I could interview some people, including uh, Red Grange and George Hallows, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the people I had to interview was Art Rooney, the owner of the Pittsburgh Steelers. So uh, when when we got there, we found out that Art Rooney was going to be in town only for a very short time. He was going to fly in on Saturday for the, the induction ceremony, and then he was going to go back to Pittsburgh. So uh, so I said to John, you know, I, I don't know, I'm not going to have time to interview Rooney. And, and he said, well, there's a reception for members of the Hall of Fame. You can interview him there. So we went to this reception on Saturday afternoon, and uh, we get to the door, and there's a big sign that says Hall of Fame members only, green badges only, and I'm wearing a yellow badge, a media badge. You know? So the security guy puts a hand on my shoulder as I try to go in, and he says, I'm sorry, sir, you, you can't go in there. It's yeah. green badges only. So Johnny Blood turns around to the guy, and he says, you won't let my son come in with me? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the guy says, "Look, he says, well, Mr. McNally, I'm sorry, but you know I have orders." And he said, "Well, if my son can't come in with me, I'm not going. Do you want to tell George Hallis and Red Grange and Ernie Nevers that the reason Johnny Blood isn't here is because you wouldn't let his son in?" So the guy said, "Well, uh, all right, you go ahead." Yeah. So, so I went in. You know, I interviewed Art Rooney, and as the thing was breaking up, the commissioner of the National Football League. Pete Rozell came in the back door and to say thank you for coming and mm-hmm. so forth. Johnny Blood nudged me and he said, you and Pete Rozell are the only guys in here who aren't wearing green badges. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, it, it helps to have friends in high places. Right? <laughs> yeah. He seemed like a character. Oh, he was a character, yeah. And he was back in the day where uh, it was like uh, hockey before helmets. Yeah, he, they he played for a team called the Duluth Eskimos in 1926. They played 29 football games in in less than four months, uh, and they used they played every they played one home game to start the season. Every other game was on the road. They went from Duluth, Minnesota, to New York City, to Florida, to California, and. Uh, they would they would take two showers after a game, 
one shower with their uniforms on to wash the uniforms. And then they'd, they'd beat the water out of their uniforms wow. and get into cabs to go to the train station to go to the next stop. And wow. So is there a such thing as for the love of the game? Yeah. I, uh, I'd say a lot. most of those guys probably did play for the love of the game in those days. I, I mean... Uh, when when Johnny Blood signed his first contract, he he got seventy five dollars a game, and that meant that if you were hurt and couldn't play, you didn't get your seventy five bucks. That no, was know. pretty good money back in the day. It wasn't bad, yeah, it wasn't bad. Uh, when most people would make seventy five a month, maybe. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, it was you know it was short. It was uh, like three months you mm-hmm. got that. So, uh, but they would. Uh, uh, the Duluth Eskimos once once played five games in eight days in an eight day period, you know. So it was crazy, yeah. and they were on the road in between. You know? wow. Wow. But when uh, another, uh, this is a typical giant. He was he was known for imbibing alcohol, mm-hmm. and when uh, Curly Lambeau, who was the owner coach of the Green Bay Packers, wanted to sign him, because he was a Wisconsin boy, so. Mm-hmm. Um, so he, uh, he had a meeting with John, this was in 1929, and Lambeau said, uh, uh, I'll, I'll pay you $110 a game if you promise not to drink after Wednesday. And John said, uh, make it a hundred dollars a game and let me drink on Wednesday too. <laughs> so, so Lambo just laughed and he said, okay, I'll give you $110 a game and you can drink on Wednesday. So. Wow. Uh, it, it, the, that kind of character, I mean, um, where did that come from? Is, was that the America, the, the, you know, the great American myth, the, the men of steel, the, all that stuff? I, I don't know. John was a... Uh, and where did blood come from? That's the other one. Well, yeah. Uh, he he had an interesting college career. Uh, he went to... Know, after He went to a little school, St. John's College in, in Minnesota. And then he... Uh, that's where he first played football. He never played football in high school. And he wanted to find out how good he was. So he decided to go to Notre Dame. St. John's was just a two-year college at mm-hmm. the time. So he went to Notre Dame thinking that he'd play football there. And um, he ended up getting thrown out of Notre Dame for a a St. Patrick's Day incident that involved tipping over a streetcar. So he still had some college eligibility left. And he he went back uh, to Minneapolis. And he decided to try out for a semi-pro football team there, which probably paid you like five bucks a game or something like that. But he didn't want to lose his eligibility, um, so he had to assume a name. His name was John Victor McNally, Jr., was his real name. So he and a friend, got, uh, John had a motorcycle. This was 1924. Um, he and his friend got on a motorcycle to go to the tryouts, and they went by a movie theater where Rudolph Valentino was starring in Blood and Sand. And so John saw the marquee, and he said, that's it, I'll be Blood and you'll be Sand. And he played under that name for 15 years in the National Football League, Johnny Blood. Johnny Blood. Yeah. You know, one of our old neighbors, number 36... Jetstream Smith. Oh yeah, yeah. Of the Chicago Bears was that of the fabled? I mean, he was like ten times, uh, he, eleven times All America. Yeah, he. Yeah, Jet is still. You know, he's uh, he's still a neighbor. We. Uh, oh, I mean, yeah. Uh, it's it, it, and, and and by the way, Ralph and and, and I lived on the same street, so yeah. it, it was an interesting neighborhood. You didn't you didn't know who you were going to bump into there. Oh yeah, yeah. Jet yeah. came here to play for the New Bedford Sweepers, of course, which I think was nineteen sixty five, sixty four, sixty yeah. five. Yeah. yeah, and even in his eighties, he still until he had that incident, uh, he was still maintaining his physique, playing racquetball. Uh, oh yeah, pretty yeah. amazing. <clears throat> of course, he worked at probate court for many, many years. As, yeah, you know, security guard. Yeah, there, it I was uh, also <laughs> when you got called for jury duty. You know, if he was on on shift, it was like, well, I know him. So <laughs> uh, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, 
the, the it's funny. Um, if you ask Johnny if he had to do it all over again, did you ask him that question? If he had to do it all over again, would he have done it the same or differently? You no, know, I I don't think I ever asked him that. I'm sure he would have. He he was uh, uh, he was very much his own person, you know, very much a free spirit. But he uh, uh, he he said he did say once that he. Uh, something to the effect that he thought if if you had to if you had to work to make a living you should do something that you really like doing and that he he uh, he spent a lot of time trying to find what it was and then finally he realized it was football. What what did he do when he retired? Um, he he did he worked as a traveling uh, uh, a salesman for a feed company where his father had worked. And um, he actually had, he came from a fairly well-to-do family, and he actually had an annuity, and uh, he spent some time, frankly, just loafing after uh, after World War II. He served in World War II, and then he uh, he spent a year on Guam just reading books and, and thinking about things, you know. And uh, he, he was a very bright guy, exceptionally mm-hmm. bright and very well-read, a big reader. You know? uh, so he was a, one of those larger-than-life characters. Yeah, he really was. Yeah. Uh, other than sports books uh, uh, and, and advertising, uh, Ralph, what, what, what else have you uh, dabbled in uh, in writing? Uh, well, I did write a book about Fairhaven, which was because of Milt George. Mm-hmm. Milt started something called the Fairhaven uh, Heritage Foundation, I think, mm-hmm. uh, you know. Um, which was in the Congregational Church over there. It was sort of like a Fairhaven Hall of Fame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so he asked me if I could write a book to raise money for it uh, about some of the people who were who were in the Fairhaven Hall of Fame. Was it? I don't. I didn't know that. The, the name. No, of the that 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 was uh, his. Uh, yeah, that was his. Jack Radcliffe wrote. Okay, actually Jack Radcliffe put that okay. together. Yeah. Uh, now, this is called Fairhaven, A Lens on History. Mm-hmm. And I kind of resisted doing it because, uh, uh, you know, I just saw, you know, writing a whole bunch of biographies just, you know. I, mm-hmm. I, but then I, finally I said to Milt, you know, I think there's a way I can organize it um, so that I can tie these people into U.S. history and world history. And uh, so that's what I tried to do in the book. So there are chapters about industry and uh, 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 one chapter about artists, in fact, and you know, which includes William Bradford. And, yes, you know, in fact, and, uh, we were just standing at his memorial, uh, you know, at the end of uh, Middle Street. Yeah, uh, as yeah. it takes that uh, that that curve yeah. and. Uh, it's amazing the amount of history in, in that small town alone. Yeah, it really is. Fairhaven is a remarkable place I, I came to found. I kind of knew that uh, early, I guess, because when I worked at the Standard Times, Charlie Lewin, who was the de facto publisher, lived mm-hmm. in Fairhaven. Dick Early, who was the the executive editor. That one, that name I remember. Yeah, right. Dick uh, uh, lived in Fairhaven, and Earl Dias, who... Uh, Earl J. Dias. Yeah, yeah, Earl, you know, wrote his look at the arts column. Yep. He and I became quite friendly. Earl, in fact, uh, um, took me on a tour of Fairhaven, and, which ended with a tour of Fairhaven High School, and he, he told me a lot about it. He, I think we probably spent two, three hours, you know, he, Mm-hmm. He just drove me around various points and you know told yeah. me about the history and yeah and uh, yeah. so uh, so I, I kind of got absorbed in the history of the area and uh, and Fairhaven you know yeah it, it's uh, uh, Milt and I were plotting and planning to do something called New Bedford Firsts oh yeah uh, we were speaking with Gus Lestady oh yeah uh, they both now departed. Um, and uh, the amount of firsts that occurred in the city, just categorically, was unbelievable. Just the American flag, first uh, the first city yeah. to fly the American flag in front of a public school building, the first flag to be flown on a, on a uh, on a vessel, on a merchant vessel. Uh, you know, the first flag to be illuminated. Well, with Mr. Theodore, he was my neighbor when I was oh, a kid yeah. in Dartmouth. Oh yeah, I know. Joe. Uh, yeah. So just in that category alone, and it was so many other categories. It was it was amazing. But then that was Milt. I mean, that was his true love. He really. Oh wanted, yeah, very much. Uh, 
Now, one, you mentioned the book. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. when he, he was putting out a new edition, he and Jack. And, uh, and uh, one, I suggested to Milt, and he kind of rejected it. Or, anyway, it never got incorporated into the book. But mm -hmm. the, the man who founded Alcoholics Anonymous... Yes, Bill Wilson. ...got his first drink at the Grinnell Mansion. Those girls <laughs> could party. <laughs> I heard that even in the days of blackouts and stuff, that that mansion on uh, County Street was ablaze with light. Oh, I believe that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's uh, I remember uh, I read uh, Bill W. Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, it was uh, yeah. It's just so. I mean, and then at the same time, you've got all this chaos going on, and you've got uh, Robert's Parliamentary Rules of Order. Oh yeah, <laughs> so, yeah that's a classic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and and that's you know the, the city uh, for so many years. Um, you know, in Lucium de Fundum, uh, you know, by the you know, we seek, uh, we seek by the light. Um, we well, spread the we light. We spread the light. Yeah, we, we spread yeah. the light. But they kept the bushel over that light for a long time. For yeah. some reason, there was this thing. They lost this verve. They lost that, that thing that uh, that uh, that the city had that was made it so unique from so many uh, other cities. You know, and Fairhaven. Let's you know, was one of well, New Bedford and Fairhaven were both the children of Dartmouth. You know, a larger entity. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, but um, uh, so what else have you done? Well, I have a lot of children and grandchildren, which <laughs> well, that's important. <laughs> yeah, they are. They that, are. That's, and that's, we've seen some of them on Thursday, Thursday Thanksgiving. Yeah, that's good. That's blessedly. Good. Now you uh, you had posted something on Facebook about uh, and we're getting down to the end of this to to, to wrap this up shortly, but. Uh, about your your family heritage, the Hickox coming over on uh, what they one of the passengers as they refer yeah, to. Yeah, my my sister. I actually I owe this to my sister Beth, my my younger sister. Unfortunately, passed away this year. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, but she did a, a tremendous amount of genealogical research, and and yeah, the the first Hickox. Uh, uh, came over from Stratford and Avon in 19, 19, yeah, 1635. And um, the name in those days, of course, orthography wasn't fixed. Shakespeare himself spelled his name in a, several different ways. Uh, but the, the name at the time was Hickox. It was like H-I-C-C-O-C-C-E-S or something like mm -hmm. that. And uh, he was one of the founders of Farmington, Connecticut, and uh, it, it struck me recently that I, I have kind of brought my family back to its ancestral roots because, uh, you know, at, uh, at some point about 18, somewhere in the 1850s, uh, my family had gone from Connecticut to Vermont, my branch of the family that is, had gone from Connecticut to Vermont to mm -hmm. upstate New York to Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I came back and now my oldest son Evan lives in Pittsfield and a short distance from there is a Granville Massachusetts which has a whole bunch of Hickok graves dating back to the like the 18th century and my second son Daniel is in Springfield and that's uh, I think about 25 miles north of Farmington Connecticut where the original William Hickok's so do you or, do you get any are you related to Wild Bill? Yeah, very distant. Uh, William Hickox had two sons, and we're we're descended from one of his sons, mm -hmm. and Wild Bill is descended from the other son. So, so it's like once removed. Then. Yeah, so we diverged, you know, very early. Yeah, but. yeah. At, at the uh, you know at the end of all of this, um, uh, I always ask this of the painters, the artists, um, um, when it's all said and done. Um, and uh, it, it's time to cross the threshold. What would you like to be best remembered for? What would you, how would you like to be remembered? Oh boy, that's a tough question. I, I think honestly, I'd, uh, I'd like to be, I have amazing children, really. And uh, I, I think I'd like to be remembered as their father, most of all. And, uh, and I, I have marvelous grandchildren as well. And, I think that's kind of my my pride in in the world right now. Yeah, to live to live on through them. Yes, exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, anything's left undone, left unsaid. You know, the bucket list, uh, whatever. Well, I'm still writing. In fact, I just 
I just started writing a book called Growing Up in Green Bay, which is uh, um, going to be about my child. My father worked for the Packers, for the Green Bay Packers. He worked for the newspaper. But I really grew up with the Packers. I went to all their home games. Mm -hmm. I was in the press box. I met, you know, players and coaches. And Green Bay is really a unique place, uh, especially when I grew up, because uh, the, the players were so close to the community. You know, it's not like in New York. You could live in Manhattan, and you mm -hmm. never see anybody who plays for the Giants or live in Boston. But in Green Bay, you just you ran into these people, you know. They were, it was a small town, it was 50,000 people. Yeah. And, uh, so it was really a different time and, you know, a, a really unique place to be at that, at that time. And so I'm, I'm kind of trying to write about that. I've, just, I've written the first three sentences. Maybe so they still get up all the newborns, little Packer hats? <clears throat> or is that just for special occasions? No, I think, I think some people do, yeah. 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 They didn't have that stuff when I was a kid. Um, the, the, the contrast between there and here, what would you say those, those are? Well, it's the Midwest in general, my experience of it, you know, having li I've lived in Wisconsin and Ohio, I, but uh, people, I think, are outwardly much more friendly there. You know, they're, uh, I remember going there one time. I, I, I return periodically to visit family, and one time I'm, and I, I was staying at my mother's house, and I just went out for a walk, and I ran into the mailman and the, and the, at the corner, and the mailman stopped, and he said, oh, you must be Millie Hickok's son, you know? And I mean, he chatted with me for 15, 20 minutes and never yeah. met him before, you know? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Uh, so, but that's kind of superficial, you know. That's surface stuff. That uh... no, it's uh, it, it's it, it's funny because you know my wife is from Detroit, so therefore okay. she speaks much better than I. Um, and her mom was an English teacher on top of all of that. Uh -uh. Uh, and so she you know, she noticed right away the speech uh, or the lack of good speech here. Um, and it is also um, culturally um, in. These other places, people look you in the eye. Here, they have a tendency of of, of not making eye contact. Yeah, with us, yeah, I think maybe that's true. To an it's kind of a but... weird thing. Of all the changes that you have seen in the city of New Bedford since 1963, you know, um, well, from your arrival, you've seen the highs and lows. Uh, um, in some cases, some of the highs would be were formerly lows, but they were lower lows. But, yeah, right, um, yeah. you know, because we, we, we love to disparage <laughs> as much as we love to praise the city. Uh, what, what do you think are some of the best, cha uh, the, the best changes that ever happened? I think a really big thing was getting UMass Dartmouth. Um, and I say that because I know that many, many students who went there were the first people in their family ever to go to college. And I think for many of them, they, they wouldn't have gone to college if that school had not been there. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think BCC is also a very big thing. Those two institutions have are really remarkable, I think. I, I have a daughter um, who got married quite young and had three kids and uh, decided she, she wanted to go to college. At, I think she was 35 or 36, and she was able to go to BCC, raising three kids, working full time, mm -hmm. went to BCC for two years, transferred to Bridgewater State, got her degree there, and uh, I mean it's incredible that she could do that. You know, I mean a, a lot of it is her, her perseverance mm -hmm. and her will, but but BCC made it really possible for her to do. She couldn't have done it without me. Yeah. You know? um, <clears throat> student population is very much like that. I taught there for 17 years uh, art history and a third of the, the class generally were people that fit your daughter's profile. They were the redoers, recover, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, reclaim, you know, whatever the reword was the uh, for their lives and, you know, restart, you know. Yep. Uh, then you had the ones who there was no other place to go. Yeah. And um, they appreciated that they had this place. Uh, and then, then, of course, unfortunately, there was always that third where they had to be somewhere because mom and dad had to say, well, they go to BCC. 
yeah. it's better than not going anywhere. Yeah, and right. And yeah. you could tell through the demographics that the caliber of student was 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 unbelievable, and their grades ranged exactly in that that order. Yeah, from, I believe that. From, yeah, my, from those of your my, daughter's uh, silk down. Yeah, the, the the daughter of whom I speak, Colette, uh, said she she was appalled that that. Uh, these kids didn't have a lot of them didn't have study habits like they, you know. She said she worked so hard. She she by the way she had a 4.0 average there. She was qualified to be the valedictorian and uh, oh, great. And uh, she was just amazed that she saw these younger kids who just weren't working as hard as they could. You know. I had a, an adult student <laughs> so, come up to me after a class. And uh, she had witnessed one of the students giving me an excuse for why he didn't turn in his paper, blah, 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 blah. She waited till everybody left, and she came up to me, and she said, look, we're adults, you and I. Who's the one that gets in their assignment on time? You. In fact, you're always the first one. Yes. I have three children, four if you include my husband. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I work 40 hours a week, yeah. and I managed to do it. Yeah. What's that little yeah, snot's problem? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. After she told me that, all of a sudden it was like, you know, okay, uh, no holes barred. Yeah. She's absolutely correct, you know, because they, they, they would try to give you those big doe eyes and oh, everything yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it was. It, it was a, you're right, the education. Uh, but on the same in the same. Uh, the same token, um, if you look at the alum from the SMTI, uh, SMU uh, days um, that were in textile engineering, mm. they all have southern addresses, and it's not because they moved there to oh, retire. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They were exported out there oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. To, to fuel the competing textile industry, which eventually led to the demise of the industry. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, no question. Yeah. Yeah, it's, sort of, it's sort of crazy. Yeah. It's sort of crazy. Uh, Ralph, uh, final question um, before we, uh, we sign off here. Um, of all the artists that you're aware of here uh, in the city that you've had uh, experience with uh, either meeting or, or their work, you know, f whether alive or dead, is there one that, that, that jumps to mind? Well, one that comes to mind currently is Allison Wells with her her, her uh, gallery downtown. Mm -hmm. um, I I kind of met Allison by accident, and I was I've always been very impressed with her work. And I don't have a lot of money. I've, I told her one time if I had unlimited wall space and an unlimited amount of money, I'd buy everything <laughs> and create my own gallery yeah, of her work. Yeah. So she's one who really strikes me. Okay. Uh, there was one that. years ago, uh, when I was at the Standard Times, there was a guy named Joe Alexander who was a young artist who, who was just kind of starting out, and he he did a, a show somewhere. I can't even remember where the show was, and it was the sort of thing that Earl Dias would normally have covered, but mm -hmm. as it turned out, I, I went to the show, and I, you know, I gave him a nice review, and and every time I saw him after that, he would thank me for that. And I mean, I'm, I'm talking years later. I'd mm. run into him 25 years later, and he'd say, you know, I, that review that you did of, of my work was so wonderful, you know. Do you know um, uh, his work is still around? Yeah, I There's know it Dr. is. Dr. Yeah. Richard Connor yeah. has his work, and he'd love to speak with you. Yeah, I, I did talk to oh, him at you? some point. He was showing his work down at that space downtown for uh, a yeah, while. Yeah, which then. became uh, one of the several restaurants that passed yeah, through right, there. Yeah. He also has a, a space now in Hatch Street. Oh, okay. So he's aware of now that. doing. Uh, uh, he's representing three estates, which brings to, to to the forefront a whole nother crisis that we're undergoing. Is that you have these dead artists who are leaving behind these works? Yeah, right. They we're yeah. all functioning, uh, profitable artists to, to varying degrees. Some yeah. of them full time artists, uh, and I mean full time because that was their only source of income. Yeah, right. And now they pass and left behind these trailer loads of work and their yeah. families don't know what to do with them yeah well yeah so um i'm trying to get richard on on the show uh and uh, and discuss that i already had written an article um on him on uh, for art scope magazine yeah see i i really i can't say i followed joe alexander but i uh, when i did see that the work that i was amazed at how 
at the different phases he went through. I mean, he was like seven, seven different artists yeah. in a lifetime. You Didn't know? he have his studio in the Bristol building on the second floor? That could well be. I'm not, yeah, I, I'm I know not there were a couple sure. of those yeah. uh, back then. In fact, you know, at some point in time, I don't know if you remember Francisco Raposa or Louis, oh, yeah. so, uh, yeah, yeah. Louis Silvia or any of those. We'll, yeah. we'll have to have you come in because I have to tell everyone, this is not a one and done. Because it's just too much information to squeeze in the forty-five yeah. minutes to an hour, and then as we as we start to converse, then we start there. Are, there are key points that I start noticing, and it's always too late, like right now. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll have to have you come back and talk about those guys because that is one of the the driving forces is yeah. to resurrect these people. Now, one I did a feature story about was Walter Owen. Who, oh, who, I worked his, with his him. Caricatures, you know. Yeah, I worked with him because. Uh, yeah. uh, Ray Basalen was my boss for oh, okay. a short while, and they were great friends. And I think Walter was a superintendent of arts at one point, and Ray also was. I don't know if yeah, I, I think who Walter came in first. was in a Kushnet maybe, or uh, he, he was or at the high school teaching. I think for a while. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah he had. A, I remember now. He I think he had an exhibit like at the old YWCA, and mm-hmm. I think that's I I saw the exhibit and interviewed him. Mm-hmm. All right. I tell you, there's a lot of uh, a lot of stuff that uh, we're looking for, uh, and, and this is going to be the final uh, portion. Um, I remember Joe Thomas from Spinner Publications uh, telling me, um, and I, I fondly remember Mo and Margie from the from the morgue of the Standard Times. That's what they called the oh, library yeah. where all the clippings were. Yep. His heart sank. He didn't have the storage space nor the money to afford it when he saw that whole morgue get dumped into a dumpster and so many of uh, Sylvia's uh, photographs and all kinds of things yeah. like that. Yeah, now... Um, Is there an archive of your work? That's what I was leading to. It, uh, not really. I have some clippings, you know, mm-hmm. so I, I think it would uh, be on microfilm, really. Right. Now, Janet Davidian rescued a lot of stuff. Okay. Uh, uh, Janet was a librarian who had become city clerk, I think. Yes, Jesus. I remember her, her. Actually, I think her name is... On somebody's birth certificate. Okay, <laughs> I remember yeah. seeing it, yeah. And she went, uh, and I have wondered about that recently, about what happened to the stuff that she rescued. I have no idea where it went. Yeah. But, yeah, that was unbelievable. Yeah. And, and that morgue was, it was so well organized. And right. I mean, everything was there. And then, you know, Margie and Mo would tell you, it depended on your political leanings, how much was in there and what was in there. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Ralph, thank you so much. Ralph Hickard, thank you you so much for dropping by. This is uh, Ron Fortier, your host of the In Focus podcast, brought to you by theartistindex.com. Until the next time, see you. Bye.